It's time now for perspective. Almost two years on from Russia's invasion of Ukraine, Ukrainian society has been transformed as people live under martial law and with hundreds of thousands of men called up to fight. With the country's counteroffensive facing a range of challenges from uncertain funding to a determined enemy. How has the war changed? What it means to be Ukrainian? Well, I'm joined in the studio now by Anna Colin Lebedev, a specialist in post-Soviet societies and contemporary Ukrainian history. Uh, she's a senior lecturer at Paris Nanterre University. Thank you so much for coming in to speak to us on France 24 today. Thank you for inviting me. Our pleasure. So, uh, of course, soldiers are dying in this war, but so too are civilians. Some of them are the victims of seemingly indiscriminate attacks on urban areas. What is morale like right now, almost two years on, uh, from Russia's invasion? Well, Ukrainians are still determined and they still know the sense of the, of the war. Uh, uh, I was told um, um, by a Ukrainian friend of mine, every time uh, the foreign media are asking me, are you tired? What they imply is not, is not are you tired, is when are you planning to give up? Uh, well, Ukrainians would respond to that question. We are exhausted, but no idea. Uh, that there is there is no pl uh, plans to to give up. They are still extremely determined, and uh, um, a huge um, uh, percentage of of the Ukrainian populations are ready to continue to fight. So you almost just answered my question there, but you say that a very small minority of Ukrainians would be in any way willing to concede Ukrainian territory in the sake of peace. I think it's not a question of territory, and all Ukrainians are aware that uh, actually the the war is not about uh, is not about lands. It's not even about people having more people for, uh, for for the Russian state. It's about Ukrainian existence itself, and they would consider that on the occupied territories, uh, Russia conducts not only an, an an oppressive occupation but also a genocidal occupation, erasing everything that is Ukrainian, sending children to Russia, having them adopted by, uh, by by Russian families, erasing their families and family memories. So for them, since Moscow claims, still claims that uh, they want to denazify the whole Ukraine, the whole Ukraine feels a threat in occupied territories, in eastern territories, in central territories, but also in the west, in Lviv. They also have actually uh, attacks on their territories and civilians are dying there. But um, I, I would say that the central issue here is that they they, the um, Ukrainians are absolutely sure that the final plan of Russia is to erase them from, from the surface of the earth as, as a nation. So as a nation, they're ready to fight. And there is a huge amount of collective trauma there. If we cast our minds back to the beginning months, the early months of the war, uh, there were uh, numerous massacres perpetrated against Ukrainian civilians by Russian forces, uh, extraordinary instances of, of bloodshed on, uh, on the ground, on the front line. How is the country as a whole dealing with that collective trauma? Has there been enough time to even attempt to deal with that trauma? They are definitely trying to do it and working with a lot of uh, foreign specialists and, and local specialists, but also with civic initiatives. Ukrainians are trying to deal in with all this on the ground. And actually, they trust a lot their NGOs. The level of trust in the NGOs is more than 90% in the Ukrainian uh, population today. They are national civic initiatives. So the, the, the self-help initiatives are there, but the whole nation, of course, will be traumatized by the war. These questions will have to be uh, to be dealt with uh, later. So far, I would say one of the major issues is that the war is going on and you still need to sacrifice more people, to send more people on the front line because, of course, Ukrainians do understand that no foreign armies will engage to help by manpower the, uh, the Ukrainian state in the near future. And there is, of course, a huge debate raging in Ukraine right now about the draft, about proposed changes to the draft. Mm -hmm. um, how divisive is that question of military conscription among your average Ukrainian town city? I would say the main point here is not about the divisions, because divisions are, are absolutely normal in a democratic societies. You have to disagree, you have to have a debate, you have to have different visions, so to, so, so we, so to advance in, the, in your thought about how your society, um, um, what, what your society's future will be. But actually, the, the main question asked here is what, um, whom are we trying to protect? And whom are we ready to sacrifice? I think our societies faced it that during COVID in a, 
I would say, lighter way? Huh? Uh, who are the to be protected first? Well, this is uh, how the question is asked in Ukraine today. Are we sacrificing younger people because younger fighters are good on the front line? But are we protecting them because it's the future of the country? Are we sacrificing women? But, or are we protecting women? And this is also, also a point of, of debate. Uh, up to one million people were drafted in the first wave of military draft uh, in 2024. Many of them went there uh, on their, uh, by themselves uh, without being forced to do that. The, the, the uh, Ukrainians engaged very voluntarily in high numbers. But after two years of war, I would say all those who were able to go by themselves and were seeing themselves able to fight, to, to take a weapon and to kill somebody in, uh, uh, on the other side of the front line, well, this number is decreasing as it would be in, it would, it would do in any society. So the question is, uh, yes, the question is this. And I would say that Ukrainians are being quite inventive lately about this, for example, using um, private recruitment offices uh, and j position, I would say, military draft as job offers, for example, uh, making Ukrainians understand But when you engage into the military, you don't necessarily go direct to the front line. You can, you can be on the back, you can be in support functions, you can be there on, as an IT specialist or as a medical professional or as an accountant, so that people would understand that it's not necessarily the end of their life to go and fight, but of course it's extremely diffi difficult. Ukraine uh, had been scheduled to hold presidential elections uh, this year. Um, that's not happening uh, under martial law. Do most Ukrainians think that was the right decision? Do most people agree that now is not the time to head to the polls? Absolutely. And I would say that President Zelensky himself was, was uh, more in favour of holding elections, but the whole society and the whole political class was against it. Of course, it's extremely difficult. I mean, they don't have to do it under martial law, as you mentioned. It's not something that is derogatory. It's, it's, it, it's absolutely regular to postpone elections until the war is over. But again, I think the, uh, the, country, the politics are back. But people are not ready to do elections uh, to the elections right now, and from a practical point of view, it's almost impossible. What what I um, how do you hold elections, for example, in the occupied territories? Do you exclude these people from the political representations? These are the very practical questions that they are asking themselves. And you mentioned the occupied territories there. Russia also planning uh, very soon on holding elections in uh, occupied territories in Ukraine. Uh, that is also enormously difficult for Ukraine to get its head around. Absolutely, for Ukraine, but, but, but also for, for the population on the ground. Uh, from what we know on the way um, Russia occupies these territories, this occupation is quite oppressive uh, uh, on a political level. It's also oppressive on an ad identity level. Uh, people are not allowed to, explain, to, to, to express any sign of Ukrainianness or any opinion that would be favorable to Ukraine. And of course, they will have, uh, the uh, occupational authorities will have to deliver a certain result to show that the occupied territories are for Russia, are for Vladimir Putin. And th this, I think, will be, will be done in, in quite a violent way. We don't know so far, but these are things that we, we, we actually have to follow in this uh, presidential election that will be held uh, in the middle of March. And Ukrainians presumably afraid that these elections are going to be used to legitimize uh, further Russian action within the occupied territories and beyond. I think within the occupied territories or um, make it legitimate in the eyes of the, of the Western countries, this is not something that will happen and that is uh, extremely threatening for, uh, for Ukraine. But definitely Russia will use these elections to speak to other countries, non-Western countries, and to send them a clear message that, look, uh, the, our, our political power is, uh, uh, is, is very popular even here in the occupied territories. We have to expect to have international observers there not the usual observers from international organizations or from a different set of countries, but of friendly countries, uh, countries and they will send a clear message about the popularity of Putin there. Anna Corinne Lebedev, a specialist in post-Soviet societies and contemporary Ukrainian history, thank you so much for coming in to speak to us on France 24 today. Thank you.